Hello, I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager, and welcome to the In Conversation With series, a series where I speak to notable figures in the realm of financial services. Listen as they share their personal journeys, thoughts on the industry, and advice for aspiring advisors. Join us at Money Marketing Interactive London on the 29th of September. Just go to mmilondon.moneymarketing.co.uk to secure your seat at our industry leading event and hear from notable figures in the industry. See you there. Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager, and today I'm joined by Chanel Pattinson. So I will let Chanel give a much better introduction of herself. So go ahead, Chanel. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, So uh, my name is Chanel Pattinson and I am a financial planner, a podcast host myself, and um, now a co-founder of a new business at Money Means. You're doing it all at this point. Um, <laughs> it sounds like there's you have your uh, you have your hand in a lot of different pies. Um, but let's start at the beginning. So, how did you get into financial services? First of all, okay. So this actually is one of my favorite stories to tell because it's just it's so random. It's one of um, my but- favorite stories to hear from people because it's never the same. Yeah, I can imagine. Honestly, this is so random. So um, my dad is financial advisor, Mm -hmm. um, has been my whole life. Like I can literally remember sitting in his office, which he still has now from the age of like five, doing my homework in the summer. Um, So always been around financial advice. um, But as I was growing up, I was like, no, it's not what I want to do. It looks so boring. Like I don't want to, this is not the career for me. And my dad was like, fine. Okay, whatever. Um, I went off and did all sorts of other really random stuff. I did like theatrical mm-hmm. makeup. I did, oh, wow. I did work to ITV. Like honestly, I was like, oh, I'll try this. Oh, I'll try that. And every time I was like, no, not for me. And I just kept doing stuff. I love um, that. I'm just all about like doing what makes you happy and especially mm-hmm. when I was younger and I had no responsibilities I was like I'm just trial and error yeah um, so my dad was like um okay why don't I was at a point where I tried god knows how many jobs by this point and he was like why don't you just try an exam in financial advice and see what you think so I was like okay fine like I'll do it um so I started studying and at the same time I was working at Debenhams like literally on a makeup counter mm-hmm. um and it was so quiet. Like I just used to stand there all day and I used to like paint my nails and it was it was so quiet. Especially and midweek, and I can imagine there's like hardly anyone there. Honestly, I'd see like three people a day and it used wow. to kill me because I'm such a people person. Mm-hmm. So I was studying on the side quite slowly because at that point I didn't have a job in financial services and I was like I was just plodding along um, and anyone who came anywhere near me on the counter I would speak to because I was so bored mm-hmm. so uh, this lady walked past and I was like oh hello like, and, and started a conversation and we got chatting and I was helping her with what she needed um, and then it, somehow we got into the conversation of financial services and stuff like that and I said oh I'm, I'm taking my first exam but I don't know what I want to do blah blah and um, she turned around and she was like oh um, I actually work at Old Mutual what it was now Quilter down yeah. the road um, I don't suppose you want to come for an interview and I was like uh, sorry <laughs> I was like you've got to be kidding me right now yeah um, and she was like a manager and she was in a position where like she could give me an interview and, and potentially a job and I was like yeah I'd, I'd love to so uh, literally the next day I had an interview and the, the day after that I had my first job in financial services like it was it was crazy honestly like can you believe that I well I can because I'm a very firm believer in fate regardless of what people might say I also have a very scientific background so I know it's not logical but um I believe that when everything just falls into place and it just feels right it makes sense as much as you're like how random is that no like certain events all had to line up for you to be in that position because you know it it was clearly meant to be for you to be in this particular path and flourish in it so um from that interview and getting into it that way um how did you kind of progress through to where you are now 
Yeah, of course. So um, I stayed at Old Mutual for a little while. I did most of my exams whilst I was there um, mm-hmm. and they were a really lovely company to work for. Like, they were really kind and, and they put me through the exams, even though I wasn't necessarily in a team that would benefit from those exams. So they were mm-hmm. really fantastic as an employer. Uh, but I then got to a point where I was like, OK, I know I was more in like an, an admin. I think I was in like disinvestment or something like that. And I knew I wanted to be a financial advisor like my dad yeah. um, at that point. I was convinced that's what I wanted to do. Did he so, give you the uh, I told you so look when you he told did. <laughs> And when he did it, he was like, and don't think I'm hiring you yet. And I was like, what do you mean you're not hiring me? He was like, you you need to get some experience. And I was thinking, you're kidding me. Like, no, but that's good because he's not a supporter of nepotism. And he gave you, you know, that opportunity to grow by yourself. Yeah. And in hindsight, and as I'm older now, I'm like, that was definitely the right decision. At the time, absolutely furious. <laughs> um, so I was like, I know I want to be an advisor. Um, so at that point... Um, quilter sort of financial training wasn't a massive thing and I couldn't really progress there so I was like I need to try and find a job to start heading in that direction um, at this point I had my level four I think um, so I kind of had the qualifications to do it finding a trainee financial planning role financial advisor role was like near on impossible like oh. I looked everywhere it just didn't exist and if it did it would be like a trainee of like five years experience and I'm like well mm. that's probably not a trainee yeah <laughs> So that I just couldn't, I couldn't find a role. So eventually I found a trainee power planning role um, and I was always happy to take the power planning route because for me, it was quite important to cement the information that I'd learn before I went and sat in front of clients and had talked mm-hmm. about it. So I got trainee for power planning role and I worked as a power planner for about four or five years. Okay. Um, and I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it, but I'm a real people person. So to sit behind a screen all day and write reports and do technical stuff, like I just struggled about that, that human interaction. Mm -hmm. So again, I knew I needed to make that next step again. And it was tough because a few of the um, companies I worked for, I said, okay, can I move into like a trainee financial advice role, stuff like that. And every single time they're like, you're too young, like no one's going to take you seriously. Like we also need you as a power planner. So it's not going to happen. So I think I had about three I know three or four companies say that Um, I know it's crazy isn't it so eventually in 2020 so literally just before the pandemic um Mm -hmm. my dad was like okay it's your time Chanel like I'm gonna hire (laughs) (laughs) so I was like okay fantastic here we go Um, and it was funny because just before I left the last company before I knew I was leaving I said look please can I try a trainee role Mm -hmm. and they're like there's just nothing for you at the moment like it's it's just not the right time blah blah so hand in my notice and they're like we'll give you a trainee role and I was like why didn't you say that anyway are companies I used to have an employee benefits background and I I just like would constantly write about companies who make these mistakes where they kind of neglect their current staff. And then once that staff member is like, right, I'm fed up, I'm leaving. That's when they want to offer what they were asking for months ago. But at this point, this person is leaving because they have another position lined up so why would you want to stay with someone who didn't believe in you initially yeah that's that's and it's also very frustrating that they kept they said that you're too young and no one will take you seriously um especially now seeing as the conversation is constantly about how can we get more younger advisors how can we get younger clients how can we close that gap you know it's crazy (laughs) I know it is crazy and like there's a lot I've learned since then in terms of okay not all clients are going to want to sit in front of me because I am young but also mm-hmm. not all clients are going to want to sit in front of older, older advisors because mm-hmm. they're older yeah. there was this real closed-minded sort of attitude towards that okay. um so yeah dad gave me the go-ahead he was like right it's, it's time and I was like amazing so um it started with dad in January and then at COVID hit mm. um and we all went into lockdown. So I did all of my kind of like competent advisor and all my training on Zoom, um, which was weird, especially again, as I was a people person, I was like, just yeah. want to sit in front of someone. And I know Zoom and like Teams and like, it's amazing, but like it yeah. still isn't quite the same, um, especially when you have no other human engagement. Because obviously we weren't, all I had was a dog and my boyfriend. People. Yeah. So it was which tough. Is great, but you need more. <laughs> yeah, I love them both, but um, a few more people would have been nice. Um, so. Uh, yeah that was 
back um, in lockdown. So I got my competent advisor status. And then that was kind of the time what happened there, which I think probably the last year has been like the turning point for me and my career was I started with experimenting with other things um so Mm -hmm. I started an Instagram account and Mm -hmm. to kind of put myself out there as a financial planner and be a bit like okay I don't look like the average financial planner Mm -hmm. uh, but actually it can be a bit more relaxed here I am with my dog in comfy clothes do you know what I mean like just painting a different picture um and that actually ended up getting me clients I never expected to get and it started opening my eyes to clients that aren't the typical financial planning client yeah um, uh, and what that then meant is I started thinking about different options so my dad's firm is just a very traditional financial advice firm mm-hmm. um quite um old school older clients um mm-hmm. percentage fee structure and that totally works for their business mm-hmm. um uh, but what I was finding is these younger clients they needed um different branding they needed different ways of working they needed to probably be online they needed probably different charging structures right. um so I was thinking about all these different things I could do and quite quickly I realized that couldn't be in my dad's business it needed to be a standalone thing mm. um so and I really had this idea I don't know if you're like this as well but like once I've got an idea and I get quite excited about it and I think it's gonna work like that's it like I'm obsessed I'm, like, you're doing it yeah yes yeah, all you can was- think about constantly constantly there was absolutely no stuff for me with this so I'm like brainstorming writing business plans like getting so excited about this idea and I said to my dad like I'm gonna do it one way or another whether I go part-time with my dad or mm-hmm. or whatever I'm gonna do this um, and then uh, what happened and again this is kind of another bit of kind of like the stars aligning and a bit of fate um was I went and spoke at a conference about the next generation of financial advice which mm-hmm. I got quite obsessed about and I'd done a lot of research and that kind of thing and it went down really well. Um, and it was a really interesting group of people in the room. And afterwards, um, a financial planner called Helena Wardle pulled me aside and said, that I really loved what you did. Um, and I loved what you talked about. And actually, we're very aligned in what we're doing. And I'm building money means. And, and it's everything you've talked about. Do you want to do it together? And like we both just sat there and was like, this is crazy. Like, this is it's so aligned and so yeah. perfect like we have to do this um so that's kind of then brought me to where I am now well I I love that puff and now going out on your own like first you know kind of figuring out where you're meant to be and then once you figured that out figuring out how to pave that path for yourself you know you had you know you worked with your dad and that was great and stuff but now you're like I can go out on my own and do this and also target a different audience which I'm sure he's probably very proud he's probably like shed a tear being like that's my girl (laughs) yeah I think it's a a shed a tear of that's my girl and she slightly ruined my retirement but he told me he's fine with that so um (laughs) he's fine about it and he I think he had to watch me for a year get so excited about this idea that I had and write business plans and and look at all the ways we could do it that he was like you you have to do this that you have to give this a go yeah so how has that been going since you've launched Money Means? Because it's launched April this year? Yeah, so it kind of technically like we haven't launched to the public. We've been okay. doing lots of stuff behind the scenes um, okay. for the last few months. And okay. we're so excited about it. Like the stuff we're doing, the value we've got for people. It's just like we really do truly think it's going to be amazing. And the whole point of what we're doing is to make financial planning accessible and relatable and enjoyable mm-hmm. and financial planning does such an amazing thing for people that it shouldn't be limited to who it can help mm-hmm. we really want to open up those doors and help more people because it can just make a huge difference like money is such a, a massive thing and it comes into every single part of our lives that everyone should be able to whether it's manage their money better or be able to work towards goals better or just they should be able to get that help so we've been doing lots of prep in the background mm-hmm. um, and we'll be launching in a in a few months time Oh, that's exciting. So how would you say your business and the way you're setting it up is different? Like you've mentioned a few uh, points of how your approach is going to be different, but what else will kind of make you stand out? And I'm making you tell me your business plan, basically, (laughs) without obviously like don't mention all of the nitty gritty stuff. But yeah. (laughs) 
Um, I suppose to be fair, it's just expanding on what I just said. Like what happened was I did some research. Um, it was a uh, hundred individuals. I asked them a series about 10 questions about what they would want from financial planning. And mm-hmm. these were individuals that had never seen a financial planner, never seen a financial advisor. Mm-hmm. They had an, a bit of an understanding what it was from whether that was my page or researching. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were between 20 and 45. And the answers I got were just so interesting. Like the biggest answer that nearly near on every single person answered was they wanted relatability. Right. And I was like, like that isn't there very much at the moment. Like no. a lot of firms are the same. Like a lot of advisors are like my dad and my poor dad gets thrown under the bus all the time when I'm talking about this sort of thing. But <laughs> he like he's amazing at what he does and like he is perfect for his clients. Yeah. Um but a twenty five year old Instagram influencer cannot relate to my dad. No. It's just different matter of fact, generations, different paths. And also your dad probably can't relate. He's like, You make money how? hundred percent like that would blow his mind like you make a post and you get how much what is a post first of all like (laughs) exactly exactly like so and it it came up so much that I was like this is it like it needs to be more relatable and that's in so many different ways whether it's the the planners themselves the people Mm. um the branding the the way we speak like that needs to be so different and I truly truly believe that and I've seen that it's on a different scale, but on my Instagram, I've seen how that works. I've seen how me being a very normal person walking the dog in, in casual clothes, but also mm-hmm. still giving financial advice, like it really works. Like people really like that. Like I get messages all the time, like, oh, like I didn't I didn't ever think I could see a financial planner. I didn't ever think it was for me. I didn't feel worthy of it. Because mm. They see like they've so many people have told me that they they see the office doors and the suits and the the corporate office and they're like I'd never step foot in there because yeah. I don't feel like I belong there, um and that I think is probably the biggest part of it for us is just making it just normalizing it and making it relatable and talking in normal language and making it and every like single thing we'll do as a company and we do now even the prep is make it about the clients and start every thought with them and I'm not saying that. The companies don't do that now because I, I know they do. I know um, financial planners, uh, the reason they do it is for their clients. And I actually had a really interesting statistic the other day that um, a, a lady I was speaking to has done a load of research on what's changed in financial services over the last sort of like five to 10 years. And the only thing that hasn't changed is how much financial advisors love their job. Mm. And I was like, that's actually a really nice thing to hear. So I see that. Like my dad loves his job. He he sad I've ruined his retirement, but like actually he loves his job because when I was working there, I was like, okay, dad, give me some clients. He's like, oh, but no, but I really need to see him and I really need to see her because like, he loves it. Yeah, um, and he's built relationships with those people. Yeah, and like, yeah, we just it will be as you can probably imagine a lot of tech going on. We're building like a lot mm-hmm. of really cool, amazing stuff. Um, to make it more accessible like we all know how long things can take in a typical financial planning and a financial advice firm like we have to slim that down if yeah. we want to reach more people um and we just got to be creative like we've got like it needs to be different we need to have some spark and just Market do yourselves things. differently yeah. yeah like and that be okay with it like be brave like I think a lot of the conversations I've had in the last year talking about how there needs to be younger advisors and talking about how we need to sometimes be a bit more relaxed and informal not everyone appreciates what I say because they don't think it's the right way to do it but like we need to at least have these conversations to prompt thinking about it mm-hmm. yeah I think that that applies to most professions I think they've had to really look at the current generation that's going to come and take over and be like, uh, they are not, they don't have the same mentality as we do. And we have to do that switch if we want to, you know, grab onto them now, otherwise, you know, they're going to move on and maybe unfortunately make mistakes and you don't want them, you know, going off and doing DIY stuff that might not work out for them. So if they're able to come to you, someone who's competent, someone who's learned all of the, you have all the qualifications necessary, but you're also able to put yourself in their shoes because you understand them. You understand, you know, their, their generation, what their values are, what they might want. And yeah. I, th- I I'm quite excited to see uh maybe we'll do another like update uh in a year's time or something on how it's been going uh that would be a quite a g- interesting conversation um but also you are a podcast host as well 
um th that's how i kind of got into got to know you from your her future bright series which i honestly love listening to i love listening to all of these interesting women with from different backgrounds and what made you decide to launch that because not only in, did you decide to kind of create your own business during like the pandemic you also were like i'm gonna take a hit, take a try and do this podcast thing as well honestly i'd like to clarify as well there's been many tears many tantrums and many very sleepless nights um, but it's been oh, amazing no. but it hasn't no but i've always seen like sometimes i put on my instagram what i'm doing and people are like gosh that's a lot. And like, I always want to say, like, I don't find it easy. It's not like, oh, I'm like swimming through this. It's like <laughs> super fun all the time. It's not sometimes, especially like, well, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, yeah. So the reason I started the podcast was basically when I, right at the start of my career, so I was about 18 when I came into the profession, um, my mm -hmm. dad would take me to um, some of the conferences and we'd go to all these things. And like, I would walk in the room and it was just a room of 95% men over 60. Yeah. And like, I'm always super quick to like jump on and say like, these, these are lovely people most of the time. Like I'm not mm -hmm. saying they weren't. Mm -hmm. However, walking in a room of 95% men over 60, like it's not a comfortable experience. No. Like it doesn't make you feel like you can speak up. It doesn't make you feel relaxed. It doesn't make you feel like you should be there. Um, mm -hmm. And I've literally had people say like, I think you're, you're at the wrong event. Like I've literally had someone come up oh. to me and be like, are you sure you're in the right place? Oh like, my yep. God. I can imagine it being, I've walked in some of those rooms and the, you know, when you're like networking and you're trying to do the networking skills that you've been taught, how exactly do you sidle up to a group of four, like 65 year old men around that age? And like what conversation are you meant to kind of unless you come in there with like obviously your dad might have been able to lead you into it I had a yeah. mentor who was able to be like oh have you met my mentee Kimberly yeah. you know that mm -hmm. was kind of that was great but going solo to these things I think would be so daunting a hundred percent and if it wasn't for my dad there would have been numerous times I would have turned and headed straight back out of that room yeah like I wouldn't have stayed. Um, so uh, there was that experience. Um, but also when I started, like LinkedIn wasn't a massive thing. Um, mm. And I just really wanted somebody to look up to who I could ask for advice and kind of follow what they were doing um, just in the world of financial services. And also a lot of the companies I worked at, again, like most of the advisors were male, like many of the companies I worked at, there wasn't any female advisors. Um, mm. And if I, there were financial advisors who were female, there was a couple yeah um, so it just felt really hard to to find somebody to to speak to to whether it's a mentor or, or get guidance or advice or something to aim for um, and from thinking about that quite a lot I then as time went on and LinkedIn did become a bigger thing and I started joining communities like next gen and ones like that I started meeting these people that I wish I'd met kind of like four years ago at the start of my career um, and I was having conversations with them and thinking I wish I could have had these conversations four years ago when I started my career. And then that thought process kind of then led to, well, why don't I kind of share them and, and put them out there? And it started at first with um, a live stream on LinkedIn, which was actually far more terrifying because it was live. And I had many mishaps where headphones died, couldn't hear anything, things yeah. crashed. Um, so that was very interesting. But then what that then meant was I was having these conversations and I was like this is like quite amazing like one I'm genuinely enjoying having the conversation like these women are amazing mm -hmm. um and two like I just feel like they could help so many people so uh, I think it must have been in lockdown because I definitely had more time on my hands than I do yeah. now um I was like okay I'm gonna make it a podcast not thinking at all what that actually meant and the actual um the hand of stuff I'd have to do um, and <laughs> I was like I really I really want this to be more accessible I want to be able to because I get it like I go for a dog or go put a podcast in my ears I don't watch yeah. a LinkedIn video whilst I'm walking the dog yeah um, so I was like I really want more people to hear this so and I kind of my first so I was like okay I'm gonna do a podcast I really want to put it out there with like a really freaking cool first guest mm -hmm. and I'm like hunting around the internet and I was like I had a few ideas who I wanted um and Ruth the CEO of Octopus I was like I'd love I'd love to have her on the podcast yeah so I sent I sent an email to Octopus like look okay 
I don't I don't really have a name for this podcast. Um, I don't really have much of a plan at this point. I don't really have any artwork. Um, but is there any chance Ruth would come on as a guest thinking that nobody is ever going to reply to me? And then they did. <laughs> and they honestly, I remember the day I got the email and I was like, you're joking. Like, oh my God, it's happening. Yeah. Like, honestly, I, I couldn't, when they said yes, I just could not believe it. And when I got on that call, I was like a child under the age of five that just been taken to the sweet shop. Oh. But I was so excited. Yeah, it's near and embarrassing how excited I was. <laughs> uh, but, but these women, like, genuinely are so inspirational and so amazing that, like, I just felt honoured to have the conversation, let alone be able to share it. Um, mm-hmm. So when Ruth said she was on board, I was like, okay, I need to make that the first episode to be able to be, able to be like, look, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Like, it's really cool. and. Mm -hmm. I knew people would notice that. Of course they would. Like she's a super amazing woman. So it started with that. And then um, I did the first season and like, I really loved it. And I was like, I'm definitely Mm going to keep doing this. Um, And now on season three, um, episode three comes out on Tuesday, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's going really well. Like we're at the point now when like, it's really weird. Like I'll go places and people are like, I listen to your podcast. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a person. What are you talking about? Honestly, I'm like, what? what? And they're like, people do listen, you know? I'm like, yeah, but it's weird. Like, <laughs> it's really weird. It's that just you like know, those projects that you wanted to start. Yeah. And because I love it so much and it's a genuine, like, I enjoy having the conversations. And I think that's why I've committed so much time to the podcast and so much effort and because I genuinely believe in it and I love it so much. And I couldn't, I couldn't do a podcast that I didn't feel that way about because it is such yeah. a huge commitment. Yeah. Um, but I continue to keep going and have um, many more series. I'd like to make it a bit more structured um, at the last mm-hmm. year with the business. And I just finished my chartered exams has been a bit crazy to be able to mm-hmm. do it super structured. But the plan is to, to hopefully have some sort of proper structure to how it goes out but yeah I just I love it it's my passion project yeah no I I enjoy it and I feel like it's pretty structured right now I feel like with other podcasts that are in the market I think you're doing a really good job especially doing it all by yourself I I personally know because I do all of the money marketing ones myself and I know how much time especially when you're juggling other work that you also have to do um and trying to make sure that you finish work on time (laughs) um it can be very difficult to do that but again because I'm also passionate about this and I I just started off loving listening to podcasts and then I was like yeah I want to do this as well and it's something that I enjoy doing um so I I can understand you know it keeps you going I think the passion keeps you going mostly and just because you enjoy it and uh probably have a gift of the gab like I've been told I love to talk I love yes. to talk to you I, well, I think obviously just from the way you're saying it, I was a power planner and I kind of didn't love it because I couldn't talk to people um I was like I have never related to someone more in my life because I like to have my alone time but get me out there and let me start speaking to people and I cannot stop yeah me too I'm with you on that I love my Friday night on my own downtime mm-hmm. chill time but if I have a day where I have like no zooms or I don't see people I get to the end of the day and I'm like oh my gosh I can't do this yeah I need some interaction yeah and it was it's so painful like during lockdown because I could you couldn't even like go to the supermarket and have a random conversation with the cashier um I know so so glad that we're past those times <laughs> me too, <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay so Someone who, even though I think your career has probably been shorter than, you know, other people, I think you have achieved a lot and also put yourself out there to be someone who's like well recognized in the industry, you know, like you speak at events and stuff like that. So I think you're in quite a good position to give advice to someone who might want to be in your position or is aspiring to get to where you're at. So what advice would you give to someone who is looking to get into financial advice or maybe be a power planner I don't know um I would say a couple of bits so my first one would be find 
a community, a mentor, find people to talk to um, and people that will support you and build you up and, and give you opportunities and, and help you and advise you like that. I can't stress now how I've had that in the last couple of years, what a difference that has made. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you'll find certain people in, in that community or whatever it is that will then make a massive difference to your career. Obviously, one of them, of course, is my dad. Um mm-hmm. But other people like Adam Owen from Next Gen, like I wouldn't have done it. many of the things I've done the last year if it wasn't for him supporting me and putting me forward and that kind of thing. And and then my new business partner, Helena, like you just need to find those people. And when you find them, make the most of them. Like they want to help, they want to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing is say yes to a lot of stuff. Um, I had this conversation the other day and I said yes to everything. And I was maybe that's a bit far um, because you do have to be mindful of the fact life is busy. And sometimes I have kind of kicked myself saying yes to everything. Yeah. Um, But I do think you should, if an opportunity comes up, say yes to it. So a prime example is the first um, real life in-person speaking event that I was offered was the money marketing Mm -hmm. event and I was absolutely petrified and I could have so easily said no but I was like I just need to do this yeah and if I wouldn't have said yes to that I didn't like a couple of weeks ago I sat on a panel for Morningstar with Ruth from Octopus and like I literally cried that day because I just couldn't believe that was happening to me um, it, it was it was really surreal um but I don't know if I would have been sat there if I didn't say yes to that first opportunity right. yeah. and every time it gets easier like the first time honestly at that money marketing event my apple watch flashed up and said are you okay your heart rate is 130 and you haven't moved for 20 minutes I looked in and I was like no I'm not okay I'm not I'm like near on heart attacks I'm so stressed <laughs> honestly whereas when I got on that stage at Morningstar obviously I was nervous um, Mm -hmm. and it's worse because I speak more when I'm nervous so I'm literally like I've eaten 85 blue M&Ms or Skittles whichever the ones are full of e-numbers and um but I was I was way less nervous than I was back at the money marketing one yeah and you learn a lot of stuff as well like I now know what I want to talk about what I feel comfortable talking about and what I don't feel comfortable talking about um and how you have to kind of stay true to that. Like I now know there are certain things I won't talk about because I don't feel strong or confident talking about them. So I know I'll be nervous. So for example, I know like, for example, bonds and tax. I know that yeah. I've done my chartered mm-hmm. exam in it, mm-hmm. but I don't, I don't like talking about it on stage. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Yeah, um, but, you don't like, want to get tripped up. And the, some of those people in the audience are cutthroat. So don't do that. Oh, cutthroat um so uh, yeah it's learning what you feel comfortable with and just yeah making the most of opportunities whether that's business like again this this money means business that I'm leaving my dad to do this which is like a massive mm-hmm. massive thing for me something I never expected would happen and again I could have quite easily said no but like I just need to do this um and yeah just just say yes to a reasonable amount of things <laughs> yeah it's gonna push you if you feel outside your comfort zone that is when the best stuff happens yeah that's true I think initially like starting out say yes to everything basically and then you know later on you'll be able to be a bit more um specific about what you say yes to but also be aware for me I always have to be aware that as much of as much as I'm a social person I do have a social battery and it will get drained and I like I, I'll find myself at the weekend being like, why am I exhausted? You know, I wasn't doing that much. But then I realized, oh, OK, I really did a lot this week. So mm-hmm. be kind to yourself as well. Self-care Sundays are very important. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. It's, it's so, so true. And just be mindful of like, when you're getting to that point. And if you think actually, OK, maybe it's a bit much if you have to not do things say no to things like that is absolutely fine yeah yeah no that's amazing thank you for uh speaking with me today chanel um i really enjoyed this conversation this was really great um and yeah good luck with money means and the podcast as well and i definitely look forward to doing a catch up in a year to see how it's going it was amazing thank you so so much for having me on i've had such good fun 
Thank you for listening to In Conversation With. We do hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.